Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another core unit lunch uh, pod session. Today we're in session number 13, actually, with uh, Amazic's uh, marketing core unit proposal. My name is Juan, I'm the facilitator from SES, and uh, and yeah, today I'm, I'm joined by the yeah, Amazic's uh, team and a bunch of maker enthusiasts to discuss the, the proposal that they have uh, submitted in the forums. Um, so yeah, a, a bunch of people, including uh, Paolo, Mitch, um, Will, I, I don't know who wants to start, guys, and give a short introduction about uh, about you. Sure, I'll, yeah. I'll do a quick introduction, uh, then I'll let Mitchell take it from there. So uh, I'm William Robinson, I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Amazix. Also joining us today is uh, Mitchell, who's our account manager and salesperson that's attributed to the MakerDAO uh, account. We also are joined by Paulo, which is one of our co-founders, uh, Rafaela and Massimo, which are two of our legal advisors from our legal advisory team. And then Al and uh, Jeff are with us from our marketing strategy team. So Mitchell, I'll let you drive from there. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> obviously we had the initial proposal that we sent and um, we've recently done a large revamp of that proposal, pretty much just rewritten it from scratch basically. And um, we've really customized that towards the MakerDAO and, and what we're looking to do with with the die currency so um i'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to review that but i can share my my screen really quickly just to show um <clears throat> what the the proposal looks like now um just give me one second i just have to update my preference for zoom now i've done it for google I have to rejoin really quickly. I'll just be, it has to reset the, the screen share. So I'll be back in a sec. Internet, everyone. It happens to the best <laughs> of us. That's, uh, it's great that, you know, we are a globally positioned company. Um, people is basically everywhere. I'm in Italy. Uh, Raffaele and Massimo, too. Um, uh, Will, uh, um, the CEO, is uh, in the US, uh, and Mitchell, uh, that was talking, uh, is in Australia. And I think in, in this moment, it's like 2 a.m. or something like that, probably. All right, Mitchell is joining now. All right, so now this should work. Okay, so you should be able to see the, um, the screen now with the updated proposal. So um, obviously we have your yeah, new bits of content here with the summary going through exactly what the marketing objective objectives will be. Um, and I guess it's, it's mainly about positioning DAI and make a DAO as the, as an alternative to traditional, um, finance and basically increasing the perceived value of DAI and educating people on the benefits of, um, of make it, of a DAO, um, in particular, make a DAO and obviously the transparency efficiency, the privacy that comes along with, with that. Um, and, I, and I guess the education goes beyond just educating about the, the products that you have and the potential to disrupt the financial systems, but also um, dispelling any misconceptions around using distributed ledger technology um, as well. So um, Basically, we will have a discovery phase, which obviously we've already kind of started doing. We're, you know, speaking about the community. Um, I shall scroll down a little bit here. Um, um, yeah, so we're, we're engaging with the community. Uh, obviously, it's not billable 
as part of you know this process, uh, understanding the goals, objectives, issues, constraints, all that sort of thing. Um, and then we're looking to move into the the, the marketing research um, from there. So uh, obviously a lot of surveys, testing, um, data analysis, um, which and all the details are in the um, in the MIP uh, forum via the link. Um, and then we're going through more planning and analysis. So uh, in the previous um, proposal, we had a, you know, just kind of this, a marketing plan to start, which was given at a, like, uh, a certain price. We've kind of broken it up. And I believe there's, there's a lot more, uh, a lot more actual value and content here um, for make a, die, make a DAO here. So definitely being revamped. Um, and then we, we come into sort of the marketing strategy, which is, you know, made planning for the, for the um, future implementation uh, that we've obviously listed in the proposal. Um, and once we've got done all the, the strategy and planning, we'll move into sort of branding as well. Um, I'm sure the details are here, building up brand guidelines, um, audits, personality and building the story as well around the brand. Um, and then we move into implementation. So um, regarding the, from the previous proposal, we've actually included um, six months of um, implementation here, which is, was more than what was in the previous proposal. Um, we've actually also included uh, legal advisory services around um, reviewing the content, making sure that it's um, compliant and obviously providing that legal service, those legal services around ensuring um, the operations of MakerDAO with regards to interacting with other <coughs> entities is, is done in a way that's compliant. So um, we've added in um, strategic advisory. So um, basically trying to really expand beyond crypto and, and into like traditional finance. Um, we'll be provide, providing the strategic, strategic advisory around that um, every month to help push that uh, forward. Obviously, public, similar to the previous um, uh, proposal, we have the public relations. Um, we've got social media, community management, um, advertising, link building and SEO, where we're getting that sort of organic content out there, optimizing domain authority, um, and doing SEO, um, <clears throat> webinars and AMAs. It's obviously quite a, a uh, beneficial um, activity to be doing in, in crypto with education. Um, so we set that all up for you, make sure all the slides, the technology set up, um, all the content, advertising it and everything. Um, influences, email campaigns. And um, down here is the, the legal, legal section that we added. Um, making sure that marketing and all our communications are compliant and um, <clears throat> ongoing support for legal as well. So um, obviously the pricing is, is significantly different, um, you know, four to six months of strategy and marketing planning, the brand development, um, market advanced market research, and then the implementation here. Um, so the, the first the month six is the first month of implementation. Um, as month one, uh, the first month of impl implementation, sorry, there are some um, initial um, pieces like influences that are only for this month. And then we have like creation, whereas the following months, the following five months, um, the implementation will look the same. So that's how we've kind of set this up um, from a, like a overview perspective. There is also um, a gun, right? Um... Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a, yeah, there is, uh, which is here. Which probably, you know, is going to help visually, to visualize, you know, the way in which we are going to, yeah. Yeah. Roll yeah. out everything. Yeah, so the, the gap will, yeah, puts it in, into perspective there. So, um, yeah, the, the proposal now, I think, is much more aligned. Um, obviously, the feedback was, you know, it was, it was a lot of buzzwords, a lot about Amazics, quite generic. Um, and we've revised that to really target exactly what we're looking to do with MakerDAO and, and the DAI currency as well.
maybe maybe Jeff, do you want to add uh, you know anything uh, in the specifics? Sure. I, I think um, one of the things is to look at the amount of time we want to spend on discovery. This whole campaign is about changing perceptions. And before we can change perceptions, we want to spend a lot of time understanding what the perceptions are, why they exist. There's certainly some portions of the world are hesitant to enter the cryptocurrency um, market, right? The people that have been stuck in traditional banking are literally stuck there. And we've got to figure out why they're stuck there and what it's going to take to unstick them. And then that's what's going to go into the execution of the campaign. The only way we find out what's got them stuck is to talk to them. So we want to do a significant discovery process to learn what are the, the preconceptions and mostly misconceptions that these people have about cryptocurrency in general and, and about DAI in particular. Um, and how do we influence them to say, oh, wow, this really is better than nationally based, nationally run currency where we're trusting the government or we're trusting Wall Street to manage our fortunes. And when we start to put it that way, people start to realize, ah, yeah, there is some risk putting everything where, where it's managed by, by bureaucrats and, and uh, uh, large uh, multinational conglomerates. So find out why they have those, those thoughts and then explain to them why they shouldn't. So ultimately, it's really an education process. Teach them why this is the right way to go, why this is the natural, correct evolution of financial infrastructure. This is the next step. Central banking worked for a while, but the problem is when it's centralized, the, 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 um, the fortunes of everybody are controlled by a few people who hide behind wealth and government um, power. And, so, and we need to educate the world why that shouldn't be the case and how we're gonna change that. So further, so further to Jeff's point about the market research, there are multiple audiences where we would do the research. Uh, so Jeff is talking about people who may not necessarily use cryptocurrency at this point. But uh, we've also done over three years of market research in terms of blockchain users to a very large database of 800,000 uh, 800, blockchain professionals, 42,000 institutional retail funds, crypto funds, funds of funds, private equity, and VCs. And so we have um, a good body of research that shows, you know, uh, why uh, uh, people favor certain cryptos, uh, their, their investment appetite, what they're looking for in investments, how they trade. And we would conduct specific research also, not just to um, uh, people who don't use crypto, but uh, existing crypto holders, traders, etc., to understand the preferences and the positioning elements uh, for you know uh, for for Dai versus for for Dai versus Frax or the other ones or or, or uh, Binance USD, why they trade those, why they hold on to those, you know why they do algo trading for those, and what are the switching mechanisms from say BUSD to DII to die you know so we would do an exhaust, uh, exhaustive deep research into understanding a lot of the things and come up with a survey with you to get the insights that you really need to make a smart decision in, in, in the market yeah let me add one more thought to that really we're looking at the world or the universe as a venn diagram with three concentric circles the biggest circle is everybody who uses currency of one sort or another and what we want to do is get them into a middle circle where they're at least using cryptocurrency. And then from the middle circle, we want to get them to an inner circle where DAI is the cryptocurrency of choice. So, so it's really, we have to target the cryptocurrency community and the non-crypto community, the people that, that are stuck on traditional currency. So, so it, it's, uh, and, and we also want to look at the DAI community learn what they've learned, why they're in DAI, and use that 
to teach the rest of the crypto why DAI is better by looking at it from the perspective of other members of the DAI community. Yeah, I mean, there are, go ahead. There are obvious reasons why you use USDT, right? There's momentum, there's brand awareness, et cetera. So unless we can capture that, and they have 96% market share of trading volume over, you know, a, on a daily basis. So there will be mechanisms in which we have to understand what are, how are they willing to trade and, and move away from USDT? What are the triggers at, at what points? Is it, you know, based on trust, the value perception, uh, the trading volume, risk appetite profile, et cetera. There's a lot of different factors that we can um, understand better. Uh, and this will help guide us into crafting the right messaging to transition that, that it's sort of like saying, you know, I'm a Mac and, and I'm a PC. And Apple has done a great job to some degree for switching uh, PC users into Apple users based on really targeted segmentation profiles and, and uh, marketing activity, right? It's the messaging and how do you come off? And that's what we need to do for DAI. Guys, can you maybe, maybe comment a bit? Oh, sorry, Paulo, go ahead. No, no, I mean, that, um, if, if there are any comments or any questions on this, and, and then I would love to leave the, the word to Massimo and Raffaele, you know, for uh, also some thoughts on, on the legal uh, support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was wondering a bit what the deliverables look like. Um, so for, for me, they might not be completely clear, and maybe you can provide some examples. Like when you say you're going to do research, is it like a like a PDF document or? Well, we'll come up with the we'll, we'll, we'll do an initial discovery. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's where we gather information from members of the DAO. Uh, we will synthesize that uh, information on a weekly basis to on a weekly and a monthly basis and give you a monthly report because there was there may not be a, an actual deliverable in uh, the discovery until we get into the completion phase, until we complete that. So we will give you an interim report of the, our findings, okay? And then a summary report of the discovery in terms of what we find, the market research that we undertake. Um, we will we'll, we'll do the, the research to the, to, to where you achieve 95, 95 to 99% confidence interval, plus or minus something like three to 5% error. So you can heavily rely on this information as being accurate and without uh, bias or error based on sampling error, for instance, okay? So you will get that report at the end of the discovery cycle, okay? And okay. we'll use that information into the analysis phase where we will analyze uh, the issues that you're facing, we will have a lot of information on why things are happening and how we can improve your uh, the die situation. Now, one of the uh, feedbacks that we got and why we entered it was a member of the DAO said, you know, we're having a lot of problems with people not minting enough. Okay, uh, that's not a demand issue; that's a supply issue from the die side. And we can uh, preliminary say that that could be a marketing communication issue and incentivization issue uh, for DAI members to mint more, right? Uh, so that you have ample supply and 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 you, you get your operations down properly. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so that's the analysis phase. You know, we would do an analysis and then we will, after the analysis, we would come up with a, a review of the analysis with the DAO and present that to the DAO. And, and then these, this is the, we would come up with options to improve the situation for the die for, for die marketing. And then we would come up with an action, uh, a marketing plan and an action plan. Okay. Nice. And, and can you guys. The format, we, we normally use PDF, but, uh, you know, we can, you know, also adapt to any, any kind of, uh, you know, Format that uh, the the the, com the community like make the community is used to to have. Mm -hmm. And can you guys comment a bit on the uh, on the amount of inputs that you need from from either different core units or different people in in Maker, uh, or if it's uh, more like uh, more more like you, you do the execution all alone without needing any additional input. No, the whole thing needs to be a very collaborative process. So um, we have 
put into the revised proposal um, a list of the objectives we believe we should be pursuing, but we want to get consensus from you guys. You may have some different ideas. You may want to add something, remove it. So um, at each step, we're going to want to say, this is what we think, get consensus. Um, now we want to go do some research. The research we can do fairly autonomously. If you guys want to track what we're doing, that's fine. Um, um, don't know yet what we're going to do, but it's, it's going to be interviews. It may be focus groups. It may be surveys. So we're going to collect lots of data from all these stakeholder groups. Um, but, but at each time, we're going to um, start with a hypothesis. And, and the market research is to validate that hypothesis or learn differently. So our hypothesis is people make these decisions for these reasons. And, and these are the reasons we have to change to get them to think differently. So we form that hypothesis, do the research to either confirm or reject the hypothesis. And then once we have that information, we can make more informed decisions about the next process. That's why the details in a proposal, we can be fairly rich in details in the beginning phases, but we can't be rich in details in the latter phases because we don't know what those details are going to be until we complete the research. There's going to be a lot of experience as well that the dye marketing core unit and other teams have, and we don't uh, want to ignore that. We, we welcome that information. <clears throat> They may have done things correctly or not so correctly, but we want that information because it's useful information. And we can use that information to craft a better plan to improve on the work that the, the core unit has already done. So we're here to leverage that work. Absolutely. The first few months is all about gaining knowledge. We can gain that knowledge ourselves or we can leverage the knowledge that that uh, any of the core units have already gathered. And, and the more information, the more knowledge we have, the better our decisions will be and the better the outcomes will be as we get into the execution phases. Hey Juan, uh, this is Kim here. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, a little bit, can you talk a little bit about your company? Uh, I look at your team. Um, on your website, and um, I'm interested in your mission as far as uh, diversity goes. I don't see one woman on your team. We have sure, I can actually speak to that, uh, Al. So, uh, in in because hiring falls under me because that's that's one of my gigs. So our head of pitch media, our copy supervision pool, about a third of our uh, copywriters are female. Uh, a portion of our graphic design pool is actually transgendered, and we are a 100% decentralized uh, consultancy company. So we have uh, people working for us all around the world three times over, uh, from myself that's in the U.S., to Paulo that's in Italy, to uh, one of my executive accounts managers is in Africa, for example, Mitchell's in Australia. Uh, so we, we are a pretty diverse company. Uh, and we are working towards getting more people of a more diverse uh, set in management as well as we continue to grow. Yeah. One year Thank ago, you. Uh, the, the head of marketing was a um, uh, uh, woman, uh, Annie um, Alexander. She is also one of the women in blockchain. And uh, she left uh, to, you know, to become uh, great, finance. Uh, yeah. yeah, community manager, um, chief uh, uh, chief operating uh, chief marketing officer in a in a great uh, blockchain project nowadays. And the PR manager was also a woman uh, that she also left uh, to. Well, still is though. Our, the replacement was. But yeah, I mean, it's we are. And I hired them both personally, by the way. So and they were great. Uh, we, uh, still a very great relationship. So we, we love diversity. Uh, we would love to differentiate. We love uh, to, to give opportunity uh, to anyone in the world, by the way. Uh, this, this, this is part of our ethos. And, and to add to that, you know, we, uh, we welcome women in senior roles, not just uh, intermediate roles. And Sabina was a, a senior strategist that was assigned to this team, but she had to leave. 
uh, unexpectedly. So she was in that role. And we have also um, Christy B, who's an adjunct professor uh, and our head uh, copywriter, uh, a second uh, head copywriter. And she's also very senior as well. So we welcome that uh, uh, in critical thinking and strategy as well. Thank you so much. Those are great answers, uh, very thorough. Uh, one more question relating to that, uh, the marketing side of, uh, of marketing to women, for example. We all know that in the crypto world, uh, it's mostly men who are involved. Um, do you have a plan or have you experienced in the past with other clients? Um, have, have you devised a strategy to uh, target women all over the world, not in any particular place? Yes. So my quick answer is yes. Um, we, we, we discussed this with several of our clients in terms of uh, gender diversity, et cetera. Um, we, I, I typically go into a conversation where, where there's a bit of a trade-off in terms of if you want to go for conversions and you want to attract uh, the highest conversion, that's typically the first approach. Uh, which is to say you have images that re uh, reflect the, the taste and preferences of your target customers, right? But that leaves a lot of people out, especially with me. It's sort of like saying, you know, the, um, it's a, it's a values-based decision, right? Uh, it, when, when Dove first came out with the, the inside or inner beauty uh, 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 commercials, um, they targeted women who were not, um, they didn't look like models, okay? They had to probably experience a lower conversion rate because people didn't necessarily say, well, all these fat people and all these other people aren't beautiful, right? So there was a key important message about, well, inner beauty, self-esteem that women all over the world really uh, appreciated. And I think a lot of men appreciated as well. And to that degree, you may take a hit initially for conversion, but overall, the value of the campaigns, I mean, the campaign won awards, right? It takes a lot more money, but you get that message out, and that becomes a calling card and a value statement that's more powerful in the long run than just going for conversions. So we typically have this conversation, like we, you know, with uh, another client, you know, he's a CEO and he's Black from Africa, right? So... Uh, there are a few blacks in that. So we decided we wanted to make him a spokesperson, invest some money in doing that for, uh, for diversity, right? And they welcome that idea and that's what they're doing. So, so it's, it's a decision that's based on the DAO, uh, on MakerDAO for diversity. Uh, there, there may be a, a budget hit in, at the beginning, but in the long run, it may be well worth it. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that has a question? We're all normal people. We're, we're here to talk with you. There is no question that's, that's wrong, right? Yeah, yeah um, I have a question. That is um, what... Um, the challenge you have here, does this resemble something you've been up against previously? I think well, it's you, similar, you can talk about FRAX. Do you want to talk about FRAX, Paul? Yeah, I mean, until a few months ago, we have been working together with FRAX, uh, which is another, you know, algorithmic stablecoin. Um, I, I, I think they are in a complete different uh, moment of their uh, life cycles in comparison to DAI and to MakerDAO since uh, they are at the very beginning. But yeah, we, we have experience with uh, people working in this specific sector uh, you know, of cybercrimes. So part of their thing was that they didn't want to come off as shilling, right? They didn't, uh, that, that was completely uh, against their ethos. And what we did was we learned their technology, their algorithms, their, their processes inside out. We took tests. Our entire team had to take a, a sort of a test. Uh, this is, and their, their founders and directors are at the PhD level and they're uh, PhD economists. So we had to get up to speed very quickly and push out content 
to the degree that it was a very soft sell. It was about thought leadership and coming up with positioning articles, etc., as opposed to shilling in, in the normal traditional blockchain sense. So that is a more strategic approach to uh, engaging with the audience. That is very, very specific in in in, um, uh, in their situation. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Um, uh, right now, I I don't have any more questions. In general, it was it, it is like comparing a uh, you know a mouse with the elephant. You know, comparing frogs with dye at uh, the moment. Yeah. But yeah. So yeah, and that situation is really quite similar. You know, they're they're really new, but they're the the they're the most stable. They they're they're peg held very closely, and they were under collateralized, right? And so they worked off of um, a curve ammo and other ammos, and and you know they have the same thing where they're going up against you know Binance and USDT, right? And these are big guys, so you have to be really strategic in how you. Um, uh, communicate and differentiate yourself, right? It's like David and Goliath, and, and you've got one yeah. slingshot. And how do you how do you use your resources most effectively? Yeah. Anyway, um, maybe we we can take some time uh, with the lawyers to also you know uh, discuss two minutes of the, the uh, legal support to marketing. Uh, Massimo and Raffaele. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, first of all, our approach is pretty not conservative, let's say. Uh, we work in a, a legal environment regarding blockchain and uh, decentralized autonomous organizations since 2012. So we are pretty enthusiastic. And we know that there are a lot of limits. And if we are following the rules, uh, we should meet some problems. Uh, our approach is to uh, is proactive, let's say. So our idea is to uh, uh, to work as a stimulus for the traditional environment in order to uh, improve uh, the legal framework, which actually is not uh, is not still built and it's still very generic. Uh, I take as example today. I had a meeting with the Italian Stock Exchange. We discussed a lot about the possibility to build a new financial product on Italian Stock Exchange and Euronext. Uh, of course, the approach is pretty conservative, but we propose to them to modify the regulation in order to uh, think about new product futures on Bitcoin, ETF, or something like this. Um, so that's our idea to work in uh, with, with you, and uh, we are pretty confident that there could be different issues. Uh, we can discuss uh, uh, step by step uh, because giving a deadlines or, or milestones at this stage could be uh, not, uh, not realistic. Um, probably a regulation regarding DAO, uh, a strict regulation regarding the participants could be useful with, uh, with a legal approach. Uh, also in consideration of what happened with uh, Slockit and, uh, and the DAO. As you, as you probably well know, there was the case of the attacker and, and the, the rules of the smart contract and the fact that the uh, Security Exchange Commission issued a report on the DAO, considering uh, the product inside the DAO as a uh, financial product uh, regulated by the Security Exchange Act and Security Act. So we would like to, to, to give the, 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 our... our uh, Consultancy in uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, it that it's good that you have considered it. Um, <clears throat> with with regards, okay. You have a proposed uh, plan for how you're going to do this, and who do you prefer um, or who do you prefer working with in MakerDAO? Because you know, MakerDAO is a is a DAO. It is uh, is not a you know a normal structured uh, organization. 
And accordingly, you, you can get all kinds of opinions coming in from left and right. <sighs> Look, to, to answer you, um, at the moment we are working, this is not the first DAO uh, that we are working with. Uh, you know, one of our first customers is Bancor and they have a DAO. Uh, we are still, you know, uh, with, with Bancor after four years. Uh, uh, we recently started working uh, a few months ago with Pillar, and they are building a DAO. And uh, in that case, for instance, we have a, a governance call uh, that we can attend to on a weekly basis, uh, where there, there is we are not basically dealing with with the uh, crowds. You know, we are dealing with a restricted number of people that are uh, selected from the DAO as um, an interface with uh, with their team, uh, at the pillar team, and with us as a partner. And so we are open to any any kind of um, existing model that you have. Uh, we can think, we can you know work out. Uh, uh, you know, and make it work. Uh, any any kind of relationship. We prefer. My personal view is that we prefer to work with uh, limited number of people because then we can optimize our as a as a representative. You know, of the world uh, of the world DAO, uh, because then we can optimize our uh, the interaction and and the work and the workflow. And and maybe to further to that. You may have suggestions on the people who have a lot of information, a lot of good, useful insights that could help. And we would look for those people that you recommend as well. Like, are there people, uh, whether they're small in votes or, you know, but loud voices that have a lot of information that's very helpful? You know, we welcome that as well, right? Yeah. Um, I'm just privately thinking about a kind of a, a guidance group or something. Um, so, so you don't have to deal with the whole community. Uh, but I, I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep those thoughts to myself for the moment. But uh, I'm just thinking you're, about it. You're, you're hitting yeah. the, the right chambers, though. Yeah. In terminology for MakerDAO, there's an expectation that there will be a core unit that because uh, when we work through these iterative processes, there's a lot of options and then we prune it down to a few options. We want someone that's been with the DAO long enough to guide that. But the final output should be an A, B, you know, red or blue, uh, you know, this font or this font. And that's where we can come to a, a larger consensus to make sure that the, the community as a whole feels involved and feels knowledgeable about what's happening. But the, the iterations, the customization to get to there will just run faster if we have a, an elected group. Uh, now, whether we elect that group with another MIP or you guys make suggestions as a group, uh, what that core unit's staffing should be for the decision-making side that represents MakerDAO, that's something we can definitely solve pretty quickly. Yes. Um, yeah, because um, uh, lately in MakerDAO, there has been some discussions around uh, the basic strategy around marketing. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly it would be kind of an advantage to have this strategy slightly settled. Uh, but again, that is, of course, just me thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. we're, we're here to assist. The, another way to put this that, that may help put this in perspective as well is we're, we're not a, a consultancy company that wants to come in and tell you how you should have done it and how you should do it in the future. It very much is a collaborative process. Uh, we want to drive in the direction that, and this goes for any project, but especially for DAOs, uh, that it's how the project wants to be driven. Uh, you know, if we come to you, I'm, I'm going to make a joke here uh, and say, you know, we want to do sleeve sponsors for you or uh, stadium banners, and it's, it's not of interest. We're not bringing value to you by doing that. Uh, a lot of the initial 
discovery phase pieces will help inform that information as well. If you're having discussions about whether you should run pay-per-click advertising versus paid media placements versus bus wrappers, uh, research can absolutely inform you know, is this the right persona? Is this the right demographic? Or is this going to be seen by the right people? And when they do consume this, are they going to recognize this as a call to action to do something with? Or is it going to be a, a Bitcoin Swiss, you know, tram driving by and going, I know what Bitcoin is, but what does Bitcoin Swiss do? So you, that type of information comes out during discovery phase, and it makes it much easier to make strategic choices about what are we going to invest time in trying to do? Is it education, positional conversion, uh, system integration with other providers, these types of pieces? Yes, yeah, a quick. Yeah. You, know, you know, part of this is that the DAO, the MakerDAO has a, a, a really unique personality, right? There's unique personalities and values that this DAO has that others don't. And we want to bring those out and highlight those to better differentiate the DAO versus your competitors. So that's gonna be really important. So we have to get this information, pull it out of the DAO and systematically and creatively uh, develop a way to communicate that, that gives you a long-term strategic advantage, right? That other DAOs can't copy. So I've heard a lot about like potential like business to consumer type marketing. Is there, do y'all do like B2B as well? And uh, if so, maybe you could speak a little more to that just because of the dye supply that exists today, about half of it is uh, issued directly against assets owned by MakerDAO and about 30% is issued against assets deposited by five users. So like we don't have a whole lot of mass market um, position at the moment. Right. So yes. So did anybody else want to take this question for B2B? Yes. Oh, okay. you, you can start out and I'll kick in afterwards. Sure. So, so the purchasing behavior of B2B is quite different from consumers, obviously. Uh, there's usually in businesses, there are, um, uh, it's a group buying decision. There may be a CFO involved, a CMO, a, C a CEO, uh, purchase, purchasing people, uh, product people or the CTO, they're all involved and they coordinate as a group to evaluate uh, the use of dye in a systematic way, right? There, there's risk associated and the benefits. So we have to address all those messages to the, the, the prospective buyer on the business side, which you don't on the consumer side, right? So the channels may be similar or different, you know, we'll still use Twitter but the messaging is more robust. It has to address all their concerns. Like, is this stable? Is this is is, is there enough momentum? Uh, as the as the as the developer, is this technology solid? You know, and we have to get to the root of the most important concerns for all those members for for that group purchasing decision. So most of our customers are actually B two B. You know. Um, from Pillar to Edu Wallet uh, to uh, P Network, they're they're primarily B two B. It's unique in the sense that we've got Jeff on because he is also consumer and he's an adjunct professor at two universities and he and he teaches entrepreneurship. So there is a consumer component that's interesting because you've got, you've got the retail part. So we've got to get both sides covered. Does that make sense? So, so I'd like to add that B two B is a longer process usually, and it's a rational, logical decision um, uh, making process they're gonna go through. Where B to C is um, emotional and impulsive. They see one ad that appeals to them, they can act. Uh, B to B, that's not the case. B to B is gonna consider things, they're gonna analyze things. Um, we, uh, Most of us have heard, heard the phrase, um, um, paralysis by analysis, right? Uh, and the challenge with B2B is to break through that, to give them enough information that they can make a rational, justifiable decision to make a decision and, and move forward. So uh, longer, more involved, more logical buying process 
versus B to C is a quick, emotional, impulsive process. Yeah. Further to Jeff, there's a, there's a recent case study that I'd like to bring up in terms of the merging of B to B and B to C. And that's with BlackBerry yeah, and their failure and their total disregard. They, BlackBerry thought they had locked up the B to B market and didn't consider the form factor that Apple had for consumers in terms of the screen to the touch screen, right? They thought they had locked up B2B, their, it was their market, they owned it. But they didn't realize that as a case study, the, the markets actually merged. When, when people who own Blackberries uh, got off work, they, they became consumers in their own right. And they actually preferred the, the touch screen, right? So they didn't listen to the market. They were overconfident in, think, in thinking that they captured the market share of, for B2B. <clears throat> and, that's, and that's a big reason why they lost to Apple. So, so this is more recent in terms of the last 10 years of what happened in, in, but it's a good case study of how not only should we be confident about our experience in B2B, but also know that B2C can affect B2B. They, there's an interplay between the two, depending on how your dye is actually used. Yeah. Um, Al and Jeff, you're, you sound very right about this. Um, I can tell you that at the moment, we, we, have, uh, we don't really have an approach. And I think we've been doing both B2B and B2C. Um, I guess uh, paper can uh, in tell you more about that. Um, uh, but of course, if, um, <laughs> if you are going to get any work done, uh, you would probably like that we settle this prior to engaging with you or anyone else. Am I correct about that? That, that you settle what prior to engaging? I, I missed something there. Um, settle uh, what group we are trying to target, because right now we have we have everything. Okay. Those are broad categories. We don't have to so, choose between those. Yeah. yeah so if, if you look look in the proposal, we do have a whole section on segmentation. We've got to figure out who we're gonna go after. And, and I don't think we have enough information to make that decision yet. We all have hypotheses, but as we do the discovery, we may find that the, there's more low hanging fruit in the consumer sector, or there's more low hanging fruit in the business sector. And it's probably more finely granulated than just business versus consumer. It's, it's industrial versus financial versus commercial. So, so we have to, break down the market into segments, learn the characteristics, the interests, the, the hesitancy of each sector, and then formulate plans on how we modify the, those perceptions. Um, and we'll use that to figure out which are the segments to go after initially. And of course, over time, we add more and more segments, but we start by going after just a few. And that... And that that yeah, decision yeah. comes from the discovery process. And it may help to actually survey your existing DAI users and figure out what is the percentage that use it for a business application or you know, group trading yes. or things like that. And, and understand your profile of existing users. To, right? to, 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 to state that in market research terms, we want to look for common characteristics. Mm -hmm. What makes a DAI user or a DAI buyer? And once we can figure that out, maybe they're um, all left-handed swimmers. And if that's the case, we've got to go start marketing to left-handed swimmers. I don't believe that's a, a real, uh, a real uh, a result there, but the point is figure out who they are so far and how do we get more of them? So I think one of the things that the, the Dow has had um, spinning our wheels on is, is like, how do we, we have, we have not been very successful at identifying and much less communicating with our, with holders of DAI. I mean, we can go and ether scan and see a list of addresses, but we have really limited visibility uh, into our users. 
Uh, that said, we're not professionals at marketing surveys. So um, how would you even like, wh where do you even start? So we start, uh, I like to start with interviews, get some people, talk to them, formulate hypotheses, and then um, uh, uh, validate those hypotheses with higher volume market research, which is typically focus groups and or surveys. But, but to have a good survey, we have to first understand what questions to ask, and we get that from initial one-on-one -on -one interviews. Right. And to get those respondents, you can get panelists who trade die. We can solicit uh, from uh, a PPC campaign looking for die users, uh, keywords that might be die or make or down, and, and get their feedback, get their information from a landing page and set up these interviews for primary research. So we can discover in general and broad terms what are the issues and et cetera for further study. So the, so the primary research is good. Uh, the, the, the focus groups and interviews are great for finding out what needs to be studied. And then we can get into statistical analysis after we do length, more lengthy surveys of panelists or a time study of specific issues that are important to the die. Right? So we find out the information first, we get them through like, like a Twitter PPC blast or uh, you know, uh, uh, a LinkedIn, so we know where they are and who they are, and then and we pull, pull more from them that way. If, if you want to understand that strategy, there's actually a textbook. I actually teach a class on market research, and, and the textbook I use is called the Market Research Toolbox. And it talks about the stages of market research. In the beginning, we do um, small quantity um, research with individuals to develop our own hypotheses. And then we validate those hypotheses with high volume research, typically things like surveys. And, and there can be intermediate steps. But the, the market research toolbook, uh, for anybody who wants to do a little bit of reading, um, provides some good insight into that process. Um, all right. Um, so let's say you're you're busy for a month or two, and you're looking at the demand side of die or whatever we have, and then you find out that there, there there is no problem on the demand side. There's a supply side problem. Um, are, are you able to make that switch? Yeah, so the initial feedback that I gave in the in the in the channel was if this is this is this is a, this is more of an operational issue with the die and and, it, <clears throat> and the tokenomics or the inf incentivization structure for minting that we have to deal with, right? So we have to communicate to die holders, mint more. How do you do that? It's through incentives or communication. How do you do that? Well, that's part of the work that we have to do. What are the messages that will help them want to mint more, right, to the users? It's got to be communicated. It's got to be frequent. Uh, they've got to be incentivized, et cetera, right? There may be more things that are appropriate, but we have to discover those in a discovery session with you. So uh, uh, let me say also that it's, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but it's just another marketing campaign. A marketing campaign is intended to change the behavior of a population. And we can change the behavior of the buyers, but in this case, if, if, if the research bears out what you just said, then, then our target audience are the minters or the potential minters, and how do we compel them to increase their efforts? And if maybe it could not be only a problem of communication, Jeff, it could also be a problem of, uh, as, uh, as uh, Al was saying, of economics. And in that case, we have uh, some of the best experts uh, of you know, economics that could eventually help uh, go and check the, the game theory behind the meeting process and maybe even support it uh, in the group that wants to know which are the issues. There's a lot of background noise. It's hard to understand everything you said. Uh, okay, sorry. 
I, I was trying to say that uh, it, it may not be only a problem of communication, it may also be a problem of uh, incentivization, as I was saying, and you know, changing or modifying the tokenomics based on the feedback that you get. And, uh, and we can also you know, activate some of the best uh, experts in, in tokenomics uh, that are working together with us through our sister company, Zero One Capital. Yeah. Sure, it may not be supply or demand, it may simply be liquidity. We've got to stimulate more volume um, in, in trade. And, and if that's the case, again, another campaign to, to stimulate more activity in that sector. And we have a consultant, his name is Everardo. He actually has a PhD and uh, he's also a CEO of a blockchain company uh, called Prescripto. And he's got an algorithm where he runs um, algorithmically uh, the tokenomics of the system to validate it. So, so there's a process involved in that that we can provide you as well, for sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, Juan? Guys, can you maybe comment a bit on the, since you have several clients, maybe you can comment on, on which part of the team is going to be dedicated fully to this project and which uh, people might come and go uh, as, as needed or if the need arises. I can, I can speak to staffing. Uh, everybody that's in this call right now that, that's been speaking is assigned to this if we close with you. And then in addition to that, there'll be at least uh, 15 adjunct and lower uh, people assigned uh, at a minimum. Uh, we, we've got two other people that are that were listed. One is Kenneth Wong. He's a, he's also a distinguished professor at Queen's University, which is number one university in Canada. Um, he's, um, you know, he's won numerous awards, a Hall of Legends of Canada. Uh, he, he has a DBA from Harvard. And then we also got an engagement manager who, who is an ex McKinsey engagement manager. So you get, you know, along with Jeff, you're getting the best of the best. Good to know. Uh, and regarding the timing, uh, I'm guessing you guys would like to formally submit this proposal on the next cycle, right? So in a week and a half, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, I think definitely would be formally submitting this one for sure. Mm -hmm. Good. I don't know if there are any other questions we're already at the top of the hour. So maybe we have like a one, one last question. All right. Uh, so guys, what's the best way to, to get in touch with you if anyone has uh, any questions, if anyone's listening to this offline? Well, um, at the moment, uh, we work it with your forum and it worked just fine. We got a lot mm -hmm. of uh, feedback from your forum. Uh, we will try to, you know, keep uh, answering you over there and, and you know, um, respect uh, your, your community feedback. That's what happens when Paulo ends up near a tall building. So, yeah, we, we're working well with the forum. Uh, and then, you know, we also have our own Telegram as well. If you guys want to swing by, if there's something urgent, a question that you absolutely need to have, that's probably the best way to start a conversation with Mitchell or myself or Paulo or, or any of the other people that you're speaking about, our community managers can get you in touch with the right people if there's a, a particular specific thing. Uh, and I'll, I'll put myself forward to, uh, to be that person on Telegram as well. Great. All right. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for coming and thanks to the MA6 team for this uh, presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you guys. Have a nice one, everyone. Okay. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.